This is the Misdirected Mark Podcast, a podcast about gaming, game mastering, and entertaining you, our listeners. We are explicit, you have been warned, and I'd like to thank Mike Willer for letting us use his music on our show. Now let's pick up those mics and get on with this thing. Uh, yes, oh yes, let us pick up those mics and get on with this thing, where we're talking about what happens when you can only game once a month or in very irregular intervals techniques to get the most out of your gaming sessions, and things you might be able to do between sessions to keep people involved. And with that, my name is Chris. And I'm Nikki. Yeah. And there's no Bob. There's no Phil. Phil's still on the men. Bob's furnace went ballistic today, so we had to have that fixed. Uh, so that's going on. And with that, I will say, Nikki, thank you for being here. And what is going on? Um, <laughs> so... This week has been crazy, and it's like one day long with work. Today was a very, very long day. I also was at work at like 11 o'clock last night. And I don't know if you guys have ever seen, most of you have probably never seen the outside of Kenesha's High School, but the inside of it at night looks like friggin' Hogwarts. It's amazing. (laughs) It's also terrifying when you're the only person there, and it's like 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night. Like... I swear it's it's so it's an old mansion and it was built in like the 20s or something. No, it hadn't been built earlier than that. Anyways, so it was built a really long time ago and it's old and it's creaky and you hear noises everywhere. And at one point earlier this year, a boiler exploded, one of them. So like it makes all sorts of weird noises and being alone there is terrible. Your, your boiler exploded? Yeah, one of our boilers exploded. Like how bad was it? Um, Well, there was no one downstairs, but... It like, exploded. I, yeah, I I know what happens when a boiler explodes. Usually it devastates a bunch of shit. Like, like knockout walls wreck a bunch of things. There's nothing else in the room, and um, these are really old, like, infrastructure sub-basements. Uh-huh. So it didn't do a ton of damage, and thank God there was actually no one down there. Yeah, because they would have yeah, died. That <laughs> happened the same day that we found out one of our students passed away. Oh. So or, that's well, what... <laughs> we told the community that one of our students passed away. That's why that news wasn't nearly as cool to talk about, apparently, as, as yeah, the other thing. Yeah, I didn't thing. tell you about it, because wow. I was kind of busy with other stuff. Yeah. For those for those who don't know, I used to work uh, as a custodian, but I used to do maintenance on boilers. So like, I've seen the aftermath of what kind of like a blown-up boiler looks like. It's kind of terrifying. It's like yeah. a small bomb. I still haven't gone down to actually see it. I just go into the creepy fan room. If anyone uh, has me on social media, you're welcome to hit me up to see the most strange server room that I have. Um, It's basically in like a murder room. Her server room is in their fan room and fan rooms are not pretty. (laughs) Well, I mean, it's so, so it's where um, our connection from the outside world comes into the building. So it's not always pretty in those uh, and that's fine. But when you're, girl and you go down into a sub basement alone with contractors and you have to go buy like this giant fan and you have like i don't know a foot and a half two feet of room just like shimmy down this hall to Uh get to it and then you get there and there's just this like boiler sound that's like the size of the entire room and then you have this fan that's like i don't know 20 30 feet long um just churning and there's like a hatch that goes down into um a catacomb-esque thing in the sub sub basement and you're just like i i could die here and no one would ever find my body it's fine really it's fine totally fine um on on a happier note uh for those who didn't hear the pre-after show um i took up cross-country skiing went for the first time on new year's eve and it's amazing and i love it and it's so much fun um bought skis and a jacket and i did i'm like and... well i decided to invest the money in making sure i didn't die in the cold and yeah it's it was actually comfortable mm-hmm. also i um was warm but i was wearing like six layers on the bottom four layers on top i was basically just sick of doing laundry so i invested in <laughs> ski clothing <laughs> it's so she didn't have to go into her scary basement well my scary basement isn't that scary oh <laughs> you guys heard last week but i've been having bats in my house yeah there was that yeah that was great i actually don't think i told the story oh we'll tell the story in a post after show uh yeah i mean we'll, we'll take a few minutes and talk about that sure um i mean i didn't want to tell it because you know yeah it's it's not for consumption on on the regular show yeah yeah and the last thing i will say is 
I uh, I sports balled for the first time in a really long time on Sunday. And, and that she was means really she funny. watched sports I ball. watched, yes, I watched football. To me, that is sports balling. Um, <laughs> and so I watched the crazy, amazing Minnesota-New Orleans game. Um, so for anyone out there who actually enjoys football, which I know there are several of you, mm-hmm. especially on, you know, the host team around here, um, that was an awesome game to watch. I said I didn't see it. Um it was also funnier to be sitting next to somebody who was a New Orleans fan as like the last 10 seconds unfolded. And it was really funny, funny. Like I actually laughed and then I felt really bad for laughing because I watched the Stanley Cup final where um, Brett Hull's skate was in the crease in game seven. And I remember what that felt like. And so then I felt really, really bad after laughing. Yeah. But now you know what wide right feels like. I was there for wide right too. Like I watched it. Yeah, I know. I was I was a tiny little football fan. You were like I was like 6. Wide right? That was 1990. I was uh I was 10 or 11. So you were like 3 or 4 years old. I would have been 5. 5 years old. It was actually 1991, so I was 6. In Jan. Yeah, because your birthday's in December. So I was 6. All right. Right. Uh-huh. Five, That's five, probably six, accurate. Whatever. Anyways, it was awesome. Um, I'm now rooting for the Vikings to get to go play the Super Bowl at home just because as be somebody cool. who literally doesn't care who wins the Super Bowl, as long as Brady is seen crying because, you know, I still live in Buffalo and I'd like to continue to live here. So I have to say that I still want to see Brady cry. Um, <laughs> I, I think that Minnesota getting to play um, a Super Bowl in their home stadium would be pretty incredible and special to watch. I agree. So, uh, Chris, what's up with you? So, I went cross-country skiing for the first time this past weekend. He did. Uh, I, I have actually, a picture. It is, a, it is, I am not conditioned to cross-country ski right now. I, uh, I, I sort of enjoy it. Um, I wish I could get the runner's high out of it, but that's not what I get from it, so it's problematic for me at the moment. So, you know, I was on an elliptical today for like 30 minutes and then ran for another 40 minutes doing uh, actual conditioning training instead of trying to lose weight like I usually do. And I'll just keep doing that until I'm uh, in a place where I can actually ski cross country and not die after 45 minutes. seems like a thing to do. So we'll check again next year and see if you like it or not. Sure. Sounds good. I don't plan on giving it up, so. Or maybe in a month. Uh, It'll still be cold in a month. In a month, I'll be in Switzerland. You will be in Switzerland, in fact. So I went to a game party, and I got to play a Donner Dinner Party, which is a social deduction game. It was, it's not my favorite social deduction game, but the people I was playing with made it uh, kind, of, kind of interestingly fun, a bunch of goofballs. Uh, I played this game called Pirates Co., board, board game. Uh, that was actually a lot of fun. Like You choose kind of where you go on this board where there's six spaces, and uh, you're trying to get resources in these cards from these cards that flip up on them. And uh, all the while, there are pirate. There's a pirate ship that is a, a villain moving around it that can probably mess your stuff up. So you kind of want to avoid that. And then if you're on the same space as somebody else, uh, you have to fight them for that spot. So uh, and you have a ship that has sails and cannons and people and uh, a hull which can hold treasure. And the point of the game is to score victory points. So you want to collect treasure and uh, coin to go to Space 6, which is Treasure Island, to bury the treasure to get victory points. There are a few other ways to get victory points, too, from the cards and from beating up people. You get, like, a victory point for beating up a person in a fight and also from beating the, uh, the villain pirates. But it's, a, it's, a, it's this fun little resource management, kind of, like, figure out what people are doing and screw your, screw your opponent's game because when you get into fights, you can basically blow up their pieces of their ship, which knock down how effective they are. So you can do that, too, which I did that to a person that was kind of mean. So it's blowing up things and pirates and screwing your neighbor this sounds like completely a game i would like oh yes this is a game that you would very much enjoy which is why i took a picture of it and sent it to you and be like you'd like this game um and then i played pitch me your movie which is another like apples to apples style game where you get four cards or you get um eight cards two from each of these different subjects uh basically like the the genre the a, a theme and element uh descriptor and then a plot and you basically pitch movies to whoever the the producer is and they can give they give out 20 million dollars um in any way that want to to the people around the table it's always fun to play that game especially with my uh my cousin brandon and my friend Alyssa, who uh, brandon makes movies for fun and Alyssa went to school for uh for film so they're enjoyable to play that game with 
Um, I played another session of my sequence game with, using Dresden as the setting. I really dig that game a lot. Um, if you are not a patron, uh, if you go and become a patron, you can hear me talk all about it in the after show. Because I already did. Because the after show was before the show today. <laughs> and that's pretty much what I did. All right. Well, um, announcements. Phil is on the mend. Um, he'll be back next week. We'll actually be recording at his place in, in the basement. So Studio 2. Or Studio One. This is Studio Two. So we'll be recording in Studio One next week. So uh, look for that. And while I'm at it, let's do this. So Todd Crapper is a professional ga- graphic designer, tabletop game designer, and writer. You have a part in this ad. I do. Look at that. I do. His game designs include Screenplay and High Plane Samurai. Mm -hmm. And his graphic design is just outstanding. He's got all the requisite skills, having a degree in print media. And has practical experience in a variety of mediums. I hear he's also worked for newspapers. Uh Uh-huh. And he's created brochures for a variety of resorts and other outdoor activity companies, including like a ski resort. And his work on High Plane Samurai and the Lost Halls of Tear... Uh, is just stunning. Mm-hmm. You can check out his portfolio yourself at his website, uh, toddcrapper.wordpress.com, and I will have a link in the show notes to that, and also on social media. And come on, for the name of this shitty, he's got to be good. That's right. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> I want uh, that tagline. <laughs> <laughs> he, he actually, or at least, I want to totally... tagline that awesome I know, for right? my life. Why does my name not give me I something don't know. like that? He actually threw it at me, too. He's like, if you would please put this at the back end of the of the ad. I'm like, absolutely, That's I'll put awesome. it at the back end you of the ad. You need to meet this man someday. Uh, he's, uh, he's, he'll be a breakout, I'm pretty sure. I've, I've met him a couple times. He's a cool guy. He was on the show once. All right, let's do this thing. Uh, workshop! Workshop! Play better games, damn it! Oh my god, let's play some better games! Rawr! Workshop! Workshop! Yeah! <laughs> I feel like uh-huh. you need to actually record that as a bumper so that, you know, it sounds awesome. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Rob said <laughs> Rob said he wanted you to um, sing the workshop bumper without hearing the music nope. playing. <laughs> Yeah, that, that probably won't actually happen. She, you can't get her to do anything that ridiculous. She's too, way, way too uh, prim and proper for anything like that, especially in front of people. Well, on a medium that's recorded, I am. <laughs> that's accurate. Get a few drinks in her. That's a completely different story. Come find me privately. Like, by drinks, you mean like caffeine, too. That's true, yeah. these days. All right. So let's, let's mm-hmm. do this whole regular thing. Since you, Phil, isn't here, I'm going to make you do the defining things. Oh, sure. So yeah. what, what is a regular gaming? Yeah, what is it? You know, I realized I didn't do a thing with these notes. Like color code them? Correct. Which is going to be so awesome. Oh, no, it's not going to be awesome <laughs> I'm just going to make all. you talk a lot. No, I just talked like for like 40 minutes waiting for you to get here. But your adoring public loves you. Oh, yes, my adoring public. That is the first time anyone's ever said that, ever, in the history of anything. Anyways, so... A regular gaming is any gaming that is longer than bi-weekly. That's what I would consider a regular gaming anyways. So that's what we're going to work with here. So if you're longer than bi-weekly, you mean like space between sessions? Correct. Yes, absolutely. Um, so, uh, Nikki, what are some problems that this causes? So your players can sometimes have a problem where they don't remember what happened between sessions. Mm-hmm. Even, you know, sometimes you as a GM might sit down and start to try to prep and be like, did we did we cover that last like where were we um <clears throat> if you miss a session for some reason like it happens to fall on a holiday or whatever it can be a month or more before you get to play again mm-hmm. um you run the risk of the game itself not being engaging enough to keep interest like if you have to perpetually be like what happened where where were we yeah you don't have that kind of continuity that that drives your story um, for games that are a little bit more technical or have more rules, you can actually just plain out forget the rules or the procedures of play. Which is a problem. Um, yeah. I mean, even as good as everyone is, like swords, we sit down after like a couple month break and got to break out the, the cheat sheets and be like, how do we play this game again? That's right. Because of the different, it's really confusing when your game has slightly different rules for different ways for different parts of play. Like that is, that gets really confusing. All right, so uh, we'll go point for point back and forth. Like, how do we get the most out of our session when we have these irregular sessions then? What is the first thing that we do? 
We don't scroll past where we are in the show notes. That, we lose our place. That's that's true. That is that is always a good thing to do. <laughs> All right. So first and foremost, um, you have to have a portion where you actually recap and make sure that everyone's on the same page. I can't tell you how many times. Um, so most of my gaming for my entire life has been irregular. I've mm-hmm. I don't think I don't think I've ever played in a weekly game like since the first summer that I role played. And having done a lot of LARPs, LARPs are monthly around here. Yeah. So I have a lot of experience actually with both playing in and um, STing or GMing um, very regular games. It's strangely the reason that you're here. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm I'm here because Phil's broken and he's missed. Oh no, because we we're gonna do we we're gonna do this topic because of you. And because Avi suggested it, I think it was. Hmm. And I think Avi suggested it. Yes. And that's what it was in there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so anyways, um, you have to make sure that everyone's on the same page. If you don't, it just ends up really disastrous. Yeah. Um, you start and then you end up having a break from the story mid through the first part of the session to try to be like, oh, oh, right. That's what happened. Uh-huh. Yeah. That, that happens quite a bit, actually, when um, you have these problems. So this, this kind of addresses... Um, the problem with uh, remembering what happened there. And what's one of the best ways to do that? Well, taking notes, right? So I'm, I'm bad at that. Yeah, I'm very lucky because I play in a game with Kevin Lovecraft and Kevin Lovecraft takes amazingly good notes. And, and Glenn does it for our other and, games. And Glenn does it for us too. So, I mean, that is that is a wonderful thing that he does. Um, one of the things that I found from games is that getting different notes from different perspectives helps. So the GM having their own notes is great, but also having one or two players, they might've caught something completely different or had different impressions of something that was said. Mm -hmm. Um, So one of the things that I would generally recommend is to actually pass out note cards to your players at the start of the game. Yeah. Um, That way they have a space dedicated to jotting down those notes. You can collect them so you can kind of review and see where your players are. And um, if you want them to give a little bit of a longer description or something, and this is kind of borrowed from how we do things in in LARP world, you can actually ask them to um, write something a little bit longer, maybe give them a bonus XP or two or something as it fits, pertains to your your game, however you want to do it. Um, And I just, I think that it's really interesting to kind of collect um the I don't think that any of us really look at at the exact same scene the same way. Mm-mm. So if if this is the only way that you remember it, um you kind of have to have that little bit of thread to know where another player was thinking, um particularly if it's something that you guys are trying to figure out in the in the game world, um or else you just you just kind of lose something. Yeah, I agree. Um, Another really clever thing that you can do, especially since we live in this age of uh, digital technology and a lot of us play games online, is you can record your sessions, especially if if you have time to listen to them. And these can be useful for for, uh, any kind of game, really. Especially these uh, these kind of irregular games because, you know, then you can actually go back and listen to what actually happened in the previous session. And believe me, the things that you thought you said in that session, they're probably not the things that actually ha- happened or were said in that session. Is the chat room like still talking? Because like it killed, it like died out on me. The chat room is talking. Um, Rob started with, I feel misled. Oh, that. I thought this was going to be like gaming in a hot air balloon and stuff. Yeah, that would be interesting regular and, uh, gaming. Somebody else followed it up with, I thought it was going to be a discussion about Pepto versus Miro. Yep, it was pretty funny. Uh, I'm sorry, I lost it. That's co- That's okay. I was, I was trying really hard not to lose it we can like keep a a, a, like count of how many times nikki loses it yeah i mean i'm very prone to laughter so we're at one we're at the count of two technically i guess if both of those things got you so that's two two nikki laughs uh two nikki losing it tonight so keep trying all right let's start with uh let's talk about starting with the genre specific action like um i i always like to start with action but action can mean different things in different genres so uh what about drama I don't know where you were going with this. This was your point in the show notes. These, these are all my points in the show yeah. notes. I was trying to pass it back and forth, but, but fine. I'm going to have you cover part of this. Sure. So the, the idea about drama is drama is about uh, conflict and interaction that is meaningful to the session. So the idea is like start with a, uh, a social situation where people start um, putting forth what matters to them and uh, 
hopefully that will play out into the rest of the session. So are you suggesting we open a session with a particular type of genre specific action? Correct. That's where I'm actually going with, with this entire thing. Cause every genre will have different types of things that are the action to that genre. And I just dropped my phone <laughs> onto the floor. So, uh, That's why don't you, why don't you continue with, uh, <laughs> the next point? Um, you had investigation on there. So like crime scene, the mystery, whatever starts your investigations trail to kind of get players down that route. Do do you need me to find the phone? Yeah. Well, think about like, um, not that it's necessarily a mystery, but sometimes it is when, uh, with with an episode of scandal, they usually start with the, the problem or the mystery or the people coming into the office to talk about what is going on. Like that is the action that you start with to jumpstart the game. Right. Okay. Um, so action adventure being the easy one, you start with an action sequence cause it's like in the name there. That's right. So like think about Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark. He starts with exploring the, um, the crypt tomb thing. And then what happens? He gets chased by a boulder out of the tomb. By the way, spoilers for anybody who hasn't seen that. It's like a fucking 30 year old movie. That's not really spoilers. So uh, and everybody, spoilers. Knows, everybody knows the boulder scene. I haven't seen the movie and I know the boulder scene, so it's fine. Um, so you also have the horror genre. So if you're trying to gear up for that, you can start with a death, um, a introduction of a monster doing something terrible, a villain, something like that. It's the monster of the week start, right? Like that's what supernatural starts with almost every episode, except, you know, maybe not in the last like seven, cause I haven't seen them, but the first five, that, that was the thing that happened all the time. So you can do that for your games. Oh, <sighs> So the next thing I'd like to talk about concerning this is like, if you're continuing from a previous session that wasn't at a resting point, I hope that you ended with a cliffhanger that caught everyone's attention. I mean, that is pr- pretty much instant buy-in and easier to remember. I would also suggest that you don't end these kinds of sessions with cliffhangers because who knows who's going to be at the next session. So that could be a problem. And for other reasons that we'll talk about later. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so... The other thing is the pacing of these types of sessions can be a little different. Um, You might set up goals for your players that are just clearly missing something in the chat room. No, no, Rob got me. He's like, Chris is such a goddamn pro. This video is amazing. Me going back and forth in the mic and trying to find my phone. (laughs) For those who didn't hear it, didn't see that because you're listening to this in podcast land. I was like crawling around my living room looking for my phone, jumping back to the mic to talk. All right, continue. Without bumping the mic. <laughs> Without bumping That's the mic. That's really the like awesome part of that. There's no there is no panda putting it up my hands on my head going on here right now. <laughs> um so depending upon the length of your session, you might end up having different goals for your players. For example, in a two hour game, you might want to try and keep a pretty high pace and make things happen. Um quickly so that the game feels like it's moving forward two hour session when you're playing it regularly you just kind of want to get those punches in there get as much action as possible cover as much story as possible and you know then let it sit out there Mm -hmm. i I mean i would personally suggest lighter game systems for stuff like this so you can move through your story um quicker or at least keep your pace better and not get bogged down in rules and minutia i mean i'm a big fan of swords without master for something like this uh fate accelerated for smaller groups i think fall of magic is a wonderful game for a short campaign and i think powered by the apocalypse games are pretty quick as far as pace goes um a four-hour game I think like you have a little more space there. So uh, you can give players some time to stretch scenes, but you should still really have some goals that you want to achieve. Uh, I mean, it's always good to have a goal or two that you really want to get to or a scene or two that you're kind of driving at. Like you don't have to be beholden to that stuff, but at least having that that thought or that note card or those couple notes there will let you uh, have something to push towards. So beat wise or kind of story pacing wise, what would you do the most differently if you were playing it as in a regular game versus if you had a week to week group? Oh, um, I would always want to make sure that my, um, my, my story beats, like I don't have too many that I want to get through. Like if I'm things about mysteries, unless you're playing some sort of weird game where the mystery is, uh, um, uh, emergent, I'm not going to have a lot of beats in my mystery. I'm going to have my beats be like my, my, my spine beats be like three or four because I know I can get to those all in that period of time or whatever the number is in that period of time. Or if I want to have a larger mystery, I'm going to make sure that my, my resting points for that mystery where people can jump in and out are those three or four beats or whatever, it, whatever the length is of my group for playtime. 
Um, that's usually where I try to hit that. Like, I want to make sure that I'm playing two resting points in my story arc and my story beats. Um, I want to try to include as many people as I can, but that's usually kind of hard depending on how long your game is. So I will use, uh, it's, it, it was popularized in, um, oh, what's the name of that game where it's modeling TV shows? It's just slipping my mind right now. Uh, uh, somebody will say, there's this, there's this game, sorry, do you know? No. Um, there's this game where you're actually playing out TV shows, and I can't remember the name of it. I'm sure you're someone's going to yell at me. thinking of Action Movie World, right? No, not at all. Okay. No, no. no. Um, oh, Primetime Adventures. There we go. Found it. Um, it will have every adventure will sort of let you put somebody as like the lead character for that adventure, and then a couple people as like the B plot characters, and a couple, and everybody else is like the C plot characters or not characters that that matter to the plot or whatever your story is or whatever your beats are. I would definitely model that because you can't really spotlight everybody all the time, depending on how long your session is, uh, especially in the two hour session, just pick somebody, let them be the main thing in a four hour session, pick somebody, let them sort of be the main thing and get some B plots in there. If you're playing all day, then you can sort of move it around. You might even have more than one story arc. Um, makes sense. It makes sense to me. All right. And I guess it leads to uh, games that are longer. Like they give you more leeway, but it might be important to keep more notes since more is likely to happen. I know that Brett from Gaming and BS, when they get together, they play like all day. They have like weekend sessions because they only get together like once a month, him and his group. Right. Um, and I know they play multiple games, but I know they play those games for like six to eight hours, I'm pretty sure. Unless Kevin wants to correct me on that. I know he's part of that group. <laughs> uh, I just keep thinking of um, the game that we've all been playing at the cons, the Knights Black Agents game. Yeah. <laughs> and you go like three, six months between playing those sessions. Yeah. Yeah, but we do. They're so much fun. They really are. I really, really quite enjoy that game. Yeah, and the characters that the characters and the players and the way that they bring it. So, I guess the next biggest thing, um, and the thing that I th that I found the most fun to kind of develop solutions for and and grapple with is how to keep players involved between sessions. Um, you're addressing by doing so the problem of engagement and remembering previous sessions. Because even if it goes a month, maybe two months without playing, if you're keeping them involved between sessions, which we can do now with modern technology, yep. yay, technology. Woo. Woo. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you can actually um, really realistically have less time um, that players are actually not engaged in the game, even if you're not actually meeting around a table. Yep. Um, so something for the players to do between the sessions, you can have recaps or downtime activities. Uh -huh. uh, if you end up not ending on a cliffhanger and time passes between sessions, ask your characters what they would be doing. How would they interact with the world? Like each character has their own motivations. And I'm sure every one of us has been playing in a game at some point and you think to yourself, wow, my character would really want to do X, but... I don't want to split the party or I don't want to take the attention away from the group. And one of the coolest things about playing a, in a regular game, or at least to me, um, is that you have that ability. You can go play around with that in your downtime. Mm -hmm. um, for that, I kind of suggest, and I think we, we talk about this a little bit later, but um, social media. Oh, yeah. Set, set something up for your group so yeah. that you can facilitate that. So well, I guess that's really step one, and yeah. this is kind of like step two. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so you can role play by post then, right? Is that what we're getting at? Um, I don't see it as much for tabletop, but LARP players absolutely have um, some type of play by post system. You'd be surprised. Some of them are using Slack now mm -hmm. between sessions. Some of them actually have an actual forum, which is weird. And I think they need to phase that out. Consider things like Slack. I might have been preaching that for a while. <laughs> um, there are plenty of um, tabletop games that do that with uh, different platforms. Like they'll have interactions and role playing between. Um, between sessions is play by post type stuff, which is awesome. Yeah. I just personally haven't seen it yeah, yeah. Um, in my groups. Um, so you definitely have that. Uh, we've had when I've played, it's been um, Facebook groups with people either coming up with a plan for the next session or doing fun little things like, Oh, post a meme about your character, you know, mm -hmm. whatever. There you go. Yeah. yeah. These things too, if you want people to really interact, you can award experience points or something to go along with if you really want to. Yeah. Uh, so in the LARP world, um, the general gist of it is you get a little bit of XP if you tell the STs, you know, what you did 
at the session, like your notes for the session. And that's super helpful in LARP world because your ST isn't there all the time. They're not watching literally every scene. Um, you also have some amount of small XP that you get for your downtime actions, telling the STs what you want to do, you know, how you're developing um, your influence in a vampire game or, you know, how you're trying to figure out or develop this contact in the police department or whatever. Um, and then you get another XP, like if you're actually participating in forum posts or that kind of thing and, and continuing to engage other players between sessions as well. There's um, there's one on here that I don't actually have that I want to mention. Yeah, um, that? As a game master, if you are so inclined and you have this ability to have these like resting points where you can have other characters doing things, you can actually have in between smaller sessions with people if they have time for it. Like one-on-one -on -one sessions that last like a half an hour or two-on-one -on -one sessions that last, you know, a period of time. And this is a thing that, that caught my attention with um, Monty Cook's new game, Invisible Sun, because that, is, that game is built to do some of those things. The ideas yeah. are right in there. So I don't know a ton of games. Uh, my weakness these days is that I don't know a ton of the game systems that are out there now. Mm -hmm. um, but stuff like... I was very heavily a White Wolf player, for anyone who doesn't know, because I'm not on here very regularly, so I just want to throw it out there. Um, uh, which we call it Mage, Mage the Awakening, was very heavily built for you to have that kind of one-on-one -on -one time. A player gets put into quiet, a player goes on a seeking. You have those sessions with your ST, and those can last one to two hours, depending upon how in-depth or you know, where you go or how shitty your roles are. <laughs> um <clears throat> But the other thing about that is uh, you can also choose to have that a one-on-one -on -one scene with another player mm -hmm. and kind of develop these really special relationships and, and a more deep um, integration between the characters because you, ha you just have that time. Mm -hmm. um, whereas if you're sitting at a table, you're, you don't think to turn to a single person and have this in-depth like philosophical conversation as your character or this in-depth like let's plot the murder of half the city <laughs> yeah right um so another thing that people can do between sessions is if your game master is open to it you can have these world building conversations creating actual npcs and locations items and organizations um if you have downtime actions this kind of fills itself out but uh, otherwise like this is all building up stuff for your game that can be utilized it's actually um, a lazy gm method as long as you don't mind letting your players have some creative uh, input to what is going on and if you let them um have downtime actions some of this fills out so i play in a vampire game i go to you know get my police influence well who is that police influence Let's talk about who that person is. Mm -hmm. Did you blackmail your way to get there? Well, then Mr. or Detective Smith or whatever, whoever your contact is, has a weakness. What's their weakness? Let's talk about that. Um, and it it ends, ends up giving not just you, but all of your players a deeper world to interact with. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many times, like playing in Phil's Hydrohacker playtest, um, we just bring up the map of... Niagara Cliffs and are looking at the various landmarks and uh, you know what's there and who controls each landmark because he has um, one NPC defined for each place mm -hmm. um, so like we we talk about where do we want to meet well we break out the map and, and find that okay and as you continue to kind of work with players to develop whatever story they're most interested in you just keep building that out and then you have a guide for everybody yeah, it's kind of great, actually. And yeah. if people are building it out together, then they're invested. And Absolutely. Easier for them to remember, too. For sure. Um, let's talk about social media platforms real quick. So there's Facebook groups. There's G Plus communities. Uh, Google Drive is a great place to take notes and keep them for everyone to see. Uh, Roll20 has like a bunch of journal -y type stuff that you can utilize if you want to. Um, Obsidian Portal is a pretty solid platform still, as far as I can tell, for all that stuff. I was just on there today looking around at it. All, all those are places that you can do all the things that we just kind of talked about. Of course, also, I like Slack channels, like, to just talk to each other, especially since it's free. Yeah. It only stores so many messages, but, I mean, if you're not using it for storage, it's perfectly fine. And, I mean, for people who are less inclined to Slack, there's also Discord, which is basically, uh -huh. like, Slack Lite. 
Um, I really don't know why people use Discord over Slack. And if anyone does, I would love to hear that. I always thought the voice over IP stuff was better on Discord. It's so clear on Slack. Like we've literally run professional meetings on there. You can't, you have to pay for Slack to have more than one person in the conversation. Oh, is that it? Yes. Oh. You yeah. can't have group conversations on Slack. I might be a little spoiled in my slacking. Maybe a little bit, Miss. I work in IT and know all these really important IT people. Uh, so I'm a, I'm a part of a Slack community um, where some of the people who work in IT and Slack uh, decided to uh, pitch an idea to Slack where we would load test all of their new features. <laughs> so we have a free paid account Um and it's got, last time I checked, around 14,000 users. And when Chris first told me how much Slack cost, I almost died. <laughs> yeah, because it's it's per user. Slack is a cost per user. And it's so. that, that is a lot of uh, free money that they're, that Slack is kind yeah. of giving away. We're super lucky. And so I don't actually really know some of the features. Rob's like, Jesus Christ. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. All right, we're going to take a break. Uh, I would say we'll go to the chat room, but I really wasn't ha was having a hard time paying attention um, to the chat room. If you want to do whatever you're going to do. Oh, no, my Slack room just refreshed. Oh, no. Your, uh, you mean your Twitch room? Yeah. Oh, no. But before that, we're going to do a network blur because there's other great shows on Misdirected Mark, such as Bonestone and Obsidian. So Wayne and Robert take monthly deep dives into the Dark Sun's setting and discuss it across all editions of D and D. I mean, who doesn't love some Dark Sun and some post apocalyptic post apocalyptic D and D? I mean, there's no gnomes there. It makes it great. All right. <clears throat> Did you notice anything in the um, Twitch that you wanted to, that, that anybody was interested in talking about that we should be talking about? See, I was just about to say you do the the thing you were gonna do, and I'll just read through the chat, and then my it chat refreshed, refreshed. I know, so I don't actually have. The yeah, sorry chat. that that uh that doesn't really happen here anymore, and I just uh. Ange wants to know what do you mean no gnomes? Uh, gnomes were exterminated. They are they're all dead. So part of the Dark Sun thing is like a bunch of the um the dragon a bunch of the sorcerer kings kind of went on these uh let's kill all of a race kind of situations mm -hmm. and the gnomes got all wiped out there are no gnomes in dark sun they're all dead that's just the thing <laughs> good thing that we don't so gnomes like but i'm a gnome i'm like good thing i am too good thing we don't live in dark sun right like we can never go there because we'll be murdered it's a kind of a problem don't go to dark sun don't go to dark sun it's a bad bad place okay Let's talk about the advantages of a regular gaming. So when you don't play as much, you can spend a lot more time creating, man. It's just way easier to find prep time. And um, I've never played with, with groups that grab props, but you have? Oh, yeah. So we played a Star Wars game where people um, would go and get, like, some of the figurines and paint them mm -hmm. and, like, bring them to game. So if we happen to steal or borrow or incorporate uh depending upon how you wish to present it a new ship um the next session one of the guys would inevitably have that ship there mm -hmm. for us to kind of use as a prop um i guess it really depends on how much uh y'all are using like a map at the table or what what exactly you're doing there um but you can also use props to increase the mood mm -hmm. um so let's say you're playing like a murder mystery game, turn off the lights, play by candlelight, you know, have a mood backing track, have a Spotify playlist, you know, however you want to do it. Um, I have also one of the coolest experiences ever. Um, it, it was super special. They're, they used to run um, twice a year games in Buffalo called Black Tea. Mm -hmm. um, it was free form somewhere between a LARP and a tabletop. Um, depending upon the day and they'd like decorate the room you wouldn't generally play in a ton of space but you decorate the room based on whatever the theme of the game was mm -hmm. which was super cool to get to play in that environment that would be really cool to play in that environment yeah. and so that star wars game i was talking about um dave schwartz ran it at his house and he and his wife they'd um, cook a dish from a Star Wars cookbook that they had for <laughs> Which our group. Is pretty cute. And that would be our dinner. I mean, a lot of gaming groups do dinner first. Our gaming group does dinner first. So uh -huh. they just kind of incorporated the theme of what we were playing into that as well. 
Um, he would have sound bites planned on his phone for like villains or whoever we'd end up meeting. Um, and it's just, it's really cool when you can involve the more senses that you can involve in your session. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's not necessarily always practical when you're playing weekly. It's true. I mean, I mean, it would be awesome if it is, but we all have limited amounts of time, uh -huh. right? Yeah. So, so prep is a thing, right? And if you play on like a Tuesday night or a Thursday night and you come home from work and then you have to cook dinner and get ready for the game, it's really not practical. Yep. Yeah, but if you are, uh, you know, got three or four weeks between games to figure this stuff out, you can have your specific playlists and the candles and the setting kind of like ready to go. Because it's kind of like your thing then. Like that's that's the thing that you've been working at. It's your hobby. Um, let's talk about another advantage, uh, that you get, which is that your character is a person unto themselves in a lot of ways, like in, in many ways, because it's not like this constant group dynamic group ensemble thing, you can explore your character's persona a little bit more and you can um, take some time away from the table with all those things that we talked about earlier with social media and whatnot to showcase your character to the other players too. Cause that, that helps. Like, I mean, right. it's good to show who you are. Um, and to know who you are as a character, but it also is, it means a lot more when you can just show that to everybody else in some way, shape, or form. And maybe not the other characters, but at least the other players. You also learn a lot more about your character the more situations your character's placed in. That's true. So if you have an ST who is allowing that downtime actions or the role play between sessions, you end up in a lot more, a lot greater variety of situations and you learn how does my character react to that stress? How does my character relate or react to this emotion? Mm -hmm. Um, and you can get some pretty cool, um, character stories from it. And I know you and I have had some, have had some not so kind fights sometimes because a lot of my gaming before I met you was LARP. Mm -hmm. So I had this very irregular experience. Um, and, and though my, my um, actual at session time was a very different style. That between session experience was very similar. Yeah, because I don't and, have any of that between session stuff though. Like I'm right. so I'm so not about that. So you and I used to have fights about how I didn't think that you know tabletop could really give that level of player investment, and it wasn't until we I really started writing this section in the show notes that I realized the crux of a lot of those flight fights had nothing to do with what happened at the session because our the awesome the more awesome you are as a gm the more you are giving players a moment to develop themselves at the table mm -hmm. but the real crux of it is that having those moments between sessions to explore your character's interests beyond the identity as a part of a group a part of the party at the table um the more you learn about that character and the more that it really becomes personal. And it's not even so much that you become personally invested in, oh, I want this piece of paper to live. I will die if it goes away. But um, the more you become invested in, this is a fully fleshed out character with motivations and drives and weaknesses and like these awful things that have happened and left scars um and, and that's nothing to do with the gm again that's just playtime. and there's also another thing that i mean we'll come to in a little while i suppose like um when you when it's uh there's a idea sometimes with that when you are in a group session and you're playing with all the people around you that you're not willing to just take that spotlight time up some people just aren't willing to take up that spotlight and soak up you know 15 20 30 minutes to actually like explore that moment of play because they feel like they're being selfish or taking away from everybody else at the table because they feel like they're supposed to be in that group dynamic. And some GMs like you really do encourage it and that's awesome. But when you get to do it once a month. Yeah, it's problematic. It's, it's pretty cool. It's, like doing it between sessions. Yeah, it absolutely yeah, yeah. is. So um, actually, I, I was actually going to bring that up. Like I'm the type of player who wants to kind of go and explore that. So what, what I was getting at is like you can have a fully fleshed out character playing a tabletop, but it's the difference between learning about a character in a short story mm -hmm. versus learning about a character over a series of novels. Sure. You just get to know them better. Yeah. Um, so I always, I actually did always feel bad and I still do. Even if you do it for me, like I feel bad the moments where like everyone else is just kind of watching a scene that I'm the star in and it's if it's for 
the drive, if we're driving towards whatever goal the group has, it doesn't bother me. But if it's because I saw something shiny and want to explore it or it it hits, you know, my character's flaw or yeah. my character's merit or whatever, um, I feel bad playing on that because I feel like I'm ruining everyone else's fun. And maybe that's wrong, but I've always kind of felt that way. Yeah, I don't think it's wrong or right. I think it's just a preference. Like, uh, I mean, it's also like a thing that you feel. Yeah. So there's a certain level of, uh, and I don't think you're alone in that. I think there are plenty of other people who feel that way too. I, uh, when I read that, I was thinking about a bunch of other people I've played with who have that same kind of problem and could use a little bit more um, time away from the table with the game master to like explore stuff. I just always like to make sure like if that happens away from the table that in some way the other players get to see it because part of it is that that they have the option to be um one entertained and informed about what's going on. We'll talk about some of my feels on that later. Okay. Yeah. Oh, uh, what's next? Um so <laughs> in some ways I always found that whenever we gave characters the or players the ability to do that mm -hmm. to go off and explore what they wanted to explore mm -hmm. there was a lot of pressure that was taken off of me as a gm it was actually kind of my specialty um <laughs> i'm not actually that great at creating story out of nothing you've actually seen that with me as a player at a table yeah. um, i need that little thread of inspiration to start from and when players are off doing things players cause trouble and if you can imagine how your game world would react to that um some of your prep is now written for you oh yeah i mean there's <laughs> there's a there's an old trick where you're like drop one thread but as soon as a player says let's go do x you're like okay let's see what happens with that right and if you're good at improvising or even just modifying on the fly or you understand your city your threads your yeah. other characters you kind of like can tie the strings together then people are just writing stuff for you and you're just facilitating so in a way it's kind of a a good tool to up your improv skills oh absolutely improv story generating skills yeah so um the one point that i was going to make when you were talking about wanting other players at the table to experience those sure. moments those personal moments mm -hmm. i completely understand why you want to do that but there's um, there's a lot of games, particularly ones that encourage your PvP. Well, then, of course, then you don't want to have that at the table. having it there, no matter how good of a role player you are, you can't unhear something. That, that's absolutely true. Um, so if you think about Vampire the Masquerade, if you're stabbing each other in the back while everyone watches, there's going to be moments where either you end up not piecing together what your character would have deduced because you don't want a metagame, mm -hmm. or you can sometimes have players who have really strong emotions like anger or hurt at the table um, as they're watching players start to plan to screw them over. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a very bad situation to deal with sometimes. Um, if you give the players the opportunity to express those plans between sessions and then give them the reasons, use your sessions to give them reasons to continue to interact with each other. So again, using the example of Vampire the Masquerade, like a court or Elysia, or something that brings them all in one room again. Um, you get some pretty special RP moments as you have this, this person that you've now just spent like two hours of, you know, another scene somewhere else trying to screw over and like set up all these like chess pieces to have their life destroyed and now you walk in and you have to like talk to them now, and interact yeah now there's a there's a thing with that like people probably shouldn't well one if the game is really about that political manipulation thing then it should be up front that it's okay for people to go behind each other's backs and backstab each other Absolutely. and plot and whatnot so your session zero your whatever your social contract or game contract um needs to should set that up right away so to avoid things like hurt feelings and whatnot like that is a that is a thing first off uh but that's true for anything that we're talking about here i think that session zero becomes even more important when you're playing an irregular game uh -huh. because you need to have that expectation with everybody um is it okay to play if not everybody's available um mm -hmm. Is there downtime actions that are encouraged slash rewarded? Because if, if you're rewarding some people for putting in extra effort and somebody else didn't necessarily know about it, that's going to cause problems too. That's true. So I think the more irregularly you see each other, and um, I think it's also true for the less you know your group, um, but 
particularly the more regularly you see each other, the more important that conversation is to be on the same page and kind of have like if you start to feel the game shift in mood or play style, have a revisit of session zero. Uh Is there anything we want to change? And if this is new for your game group, if situations have changed and you're now starting to try a regular gaming um, just to keep your group together, perhaps check in more often, like have a moment for at least the first couple of sessions and revisit what should we do better? Are you guys happy with how we're going? Should we do more? Should we do less between sessions? Like what's working, what's not? And if uh, you don't want to take, I prefer to do that kind of stuff during, during the end, near the end of a session that you're with each other or even yeah, generally dur- during the end. But if you can't do it then, or you don't want to take the time to do it, then you can just do it in one of your social media groups that you've created for the gr- game too. Like Absolutely. It's a good place to check in. But make sure you're getting everybody's feedback if mm-hmm. you're doing it there. Absolutely. Um, so let's talk about this idea of this living world that we're playing in. <laughs> I love living worlds. So... Oh, well, you, it was your point. Why don't you hit it? So um, I guess I should probably state what I consider a living world to Sure. Be. Yeah, absolutely. Right. So a living world is... Um, hit, hit me definition panda? N- no. Def- so Definition, I don't know. I don't de- even know that I'm giving a good definition. But sure. the point of a living world is that there are components, there are people, like there is a status quo and you can affect it. You can affect those people. But the world will notice the world reacts to your actions Uh and just as you can affect the world, the world can then in turn affect you. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's that, it's that push and pull and kind of thinking of, well, what does the world think? Um, the example I would give goes back to mage. Um, mage tells us that if a mage truly believes it and is good enough at, at being a mage, he can whip a fireball down Main Street. What does the world do to him because he's done that? Yeah, because the world reacts to mages doing and things like that. And he gets paradox. Like, uh-huh. So there are games where this is built in. This concept of a living world is built in. Um, you can see it more in um, some social games too or, or more games that have like a social rule set component like Urban Shadows. Yeah, because so debts. You have debts. You have your rumor system. Mm-hmm. Um, so that is something that's codified in there, but you can do it for any game. It's true. I mean, for instance, if you're playing Vampire the Masquerade and you uh, you take out one of the the sheriff in town's lieutenants the sheriff is probably going to start coming to look for you. Sure. And you can have it as simple as you're playing D&D and you've, you know, just destroyed, um, I don't know, a drow city. The next city that you come into, people might hear about that. Uh-huh. You, or, you know, you killed that dragon. Now you're famous, but you're also probably rich. So people are going to come after you for that, too. Yeah. Yeah. Consequences for the good stuff and the bad. Yep. Absolutely. Um, so when you allow individual actions to mean more um the world is explored because you're creating more and more npcs yeah the more you're giving a person the chance to go out there and say i'm gonna talk to a person in um the mayor's office well now you have an idea of what the mayor's office looks like in your city Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and what we're talking about here is like it could be individual actions during play uh because larp right but this could also be those individual actions that you take between sessions. Exactly. And then you can bring the stuff back up in the actual session that you're playing. And that's where we're going with it this here. I'm kind of modeling some of the experiences that we've had because I've LARPs have been doing this for forever, right? Mm-hmm. Like we can borrow from them because it's still role playing. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you can come back and have that. Um, if your player has, you know, gone to investigate or attempted find attempt to buy some sawed off shotguns and they got into an altercation with a local gang and burned a warehouse down and this happens like two or three times there's now news stories there's now an increased police presence probably that your players have to deal with the next time they're out there trying to do everything that they would normally do um so part of your prep if you're allowing those downtime actions is to kind of correlate everything that everybody's done. 
understanding that not everybody knows, you know, Johnny went off and did this, Mary did that. Um, and you, you're not going to tell See, everybody. That's what they did. where it becomes actually more interesting when everybody doesn't know what everybody else is doing, because now you can start, that is a way for everybody to start figuring out that things have happened. Yeah. And the world is reacting to the things that have happened. It's really clever if you're going to play a game like Urban Shadows or something like that, yeah. or a game where everybody's not actually telling everybody what's going on. And so now you as a GM have the responsibility to correlate these, but you have the fun of sitting down and correlating these. And I say it like that because you're not only deciding how other players hear about this in the form of rumors or in the form of messages from their contacts or, or in the whatever. form of how the world has actually changed and or news stories yes exactly but you can now drop your own plots this way so there was a comment before it reloaded so i apologize i don't know who who said it um but the comment from somebody in the chat room way earlier when we were talking about investigation and mystery type things mm -hmm. was that sometimes you either get players who miss it entirely miss the clues entirely or players figure it out within the first like 10 15 minutes and then you're like well what are we doing for the rest of the session <laughs> you have the ability to build this kind of investigative thing with much smaller clues and build it up over time by dropping it as part of this hey this is what you've heard from your contacts this is what the world is telling you and this is how the world's acting now since the last time we played since time has passed for those people um, who have listened to a billion episodes of misdirected mark uh go listen to the mysteries episode and then that that i have problems with that there is the trail methodology there's the onion methodology which is what you're talking about in a lot of ways um those things are great for that that is a, a perfect way to conduct mysteries and to show that stuff off so I guess what I'm thinking of is the pacing of that there. Like if that's not the focus of your session tonight, but it's a component of your game, yeah. it doesn't necessarily matter. However you choose to drop trail versus not uh, or versus onion or whatever other methods you have. Um, it doesn't matter how slowly that plays out because it's a component to the things that folks are choosing to explore. Yeah. The other cool thing about having a living world is your players have a much greater control over how that session goes. Think of like the traditional adventure style gaming, like you're putting them into a situation. They have to deal with the situation. They then proceed from there here versus like getting to have this entire world. And so what do you guys want to do? Hmm, that's a, it doesn't have to be just because you're playing it regularly. No. But the more you have a living world. I'm thinking about the, the concept. What you're con calling a living world is what generally is considered a sandbox. Like, here's a box of things that are going on. Mm -hmm. um, whether they are pertinent or not pertinent to, to what is the characters. The characters can start then poking at things that they find to be interesting that are relevant to them and their interests. And then the sandbox starts shifting. So we can have a discussion some other time on how the two of those things differ. Sure. But that's kind of the cool parts of what I was thinking of there. Yeah, it's neat. Because, uh, I mean, if your living world is is too big, you can't actually manage as a game master or a storyteller the shifts, right? Right, like It exactly. has to be contained in some way, shape, so or form. So you think of it like um, when we were doing LARPs, we would do a city level mostly. Uh -huh. Um if you're doing a tabletop, you probably do like a local community or like one level of... Well, you could still do the city. That's I mean, Urban Shadows is built to do the city. Yeah. I in mean, fact, it depends how, how big you're comfortable yeah. going. In fact, the setup for Urban Shadows is, is exactly what you're talking about in a lot of ways because it's really... In, I mean, maybe not exactly because the players actually get to influence a lot of that stuff more because of the questions at the beginning of the session. Mm -hmm. But uh, I mean, it's kind of... This, it's a similar concept. I wouldn't say it's the same concept. Right. And I mean, you can still direct players to go after a particular thing or present them with the monster of the week or mm -hmm. whatever. But it's cool to kind of um, throw out different little threads and see where players tend to go. Because yeah, now we're going, you're, sorry. Because you're now giving them the option of what type of genre, what type of beat do they want to experience. Yeah, we are flipping the game from being uh, driven by the game master to being driven by the players, which is cool too. Like I like, I like all of that stuff. I think that's all really cool stuff to do. Uh, what's next? I think we've actually covered pretty much everything, haven't we? Um, oh, it's also easier to play without a full table. Right. So since it's not uncommon for players to have a, a story, 
outside of the group, it's not weird when you're missing a party member because you just kind of show up and you continue with the stories that were created between sessions. And you have a community of people who work together as opposed to a traditional party where everyone's filling a specific role. Correct. Like, and also because of all the stuff that we just talked about, the idea is to create story between sessions with these characters so that when they come to the table, they have their own threads that we can pull on. So if they have their own threads that we can pull on, then we don't necessarily need the main whatever the game master brought. I don't even call it the main. We don't need whatever the game master brought to play. We can just play with yep. the people and their threats. And so if somebody can't make it for some reason and they miss a session and they're now two months without play, they can still be engaged because they have options to continue that role playing, continue learning about the world in between sessions. It in fact makes your the living world uh, idea uh, a more useful um, setup to play games like this if you're not especially if you're not expecting to have everyone at the table every time yeah. it works a lot better because you yeah. don't have to worry about missing players we used to do this kind of thing in college um with just pickup games you had your own character oh nice um saturdays we'd sit down at one o'clock who was ever was there was there as long as we had four players we'd run um that was pretty awesome um so what what types of games fit this the best well we've Mentioned a bunch of them already, actually, during the session. Like, Urban Shadows is one of them. Uh, the debts and the rumor system really work pretty well there, especially the the, the rumor system. That's the Isn't the rumor system the part that goes right at the beginning of play, if I remember correctly? I believe so. Yeah, it's that's pretty slick. I mean, I've only clever. played it at a con, so... I just read it again. I'm pretty sure that's what they yeah. called it. Um, vampire. Any type of political intrigue. Yeah, political intrigue is great for all this kind of stuff, right? Yeah. Also, conspiracies that you're trying to unravel. Yeah. Yeah. Like that, th those kind of games are great for this. And just because we're saying these things and they sound like they're supposed to be uh, like political intrigue and conspiracy type stuff do not necessarily have to be modern or modern fantasy. Like you can do that stuff in any genre that you want to. That's accurate. Yeah. Um, Invisible Sun was built for this kind of play. Uh, that is just a thing. Like from everything I've read about it and heard about it, this is this is exactly what Monty Cook was kind of aiming at when he designed that game. So I think you can do it with pretty much any game, but you are challenged more if you play um, something that is a lot heavier rule set. And we see this with my kids. Um, they only get to play twice a month at most, but sometimes they'll only get to play once a month or once every other month um, a particular game because that's just, you know, when they can get everybody to sit down. Um, and... D and D is always what they want to play, and it's so hard because they have to re-remember the rules every time. Yeah. So that's when we start referring back to some of your episodes on creating cheat sheets, and uh -huh. you know, or playing simpler games. Well, yes, but if you have a group that can only play regularly and they only want to play something like D and D, I mean, yep. Then you then we you need also have to address that situation. You, you can also just refer to all the stuff that we just talked about because uh, some of it is um. I don't know if we talked about cheat sheets and things like that, but there are, but, um, the stuff about story beats and pacing and things like that, like yeah. that is also all very good information for what's going on here. Absolutely. Uh, is that it? Are we wrapping this thing up? Um, I think so. Unless there's anything in the chat room. No, I don't think so. Uh, don't think so either. all right. So that's our topic. We hope you got some solid information about how to stretch out your play experiences when getting together for sessions are far less common because that was primarily our advice. Like there's try to get those things in the in-between. But I mean, we did talk about how to get that stuff. Um, if you're really just playing at the table, like try to try to keep pace, try to try to be very direct with what you're trying to do. Hit it, hit it hard. Uh, keep your keep your beats um, pretty tight. And Ange makes one point that I want to. Uh, state so she said that her problem with the living world or with living world games is that usually gms make no effort to actually integrate the pcs into the world of the game um it's all plug and play without regard to who the pcs are and what their relationship to the world might be i thought we actually and said that the living world is kind of the opposite of that because it was about them how the characters want to interact with the some things gms do things poorly yeah and we do caution just generally against the pitfall of if you're the one who built out the world and created that world, um, just make sure that you're giving your players the opportunity to affect it and decide that. We were talking with the presumption that players were really fleshing that out by what they chose to interact with. Mm -hmm. um, but that is a really good point. Like that's the pitfall. Um, some people get really into the creative writing behind, oh, I'm going to create this whole like, crazy history and architecture of this city 
and you're never going to figure it out or, you know, you can't know these cool things that I hid in like page 50 of my notes over here for later and that make it really difficult for you to actually learn anything about this world. Yeah. Um, and she just said that she thought what we were talking about was um, when we first started talking about it, because she's a little behind us when she made the comment, was uh, the organized play style of living world like Shadowrun missions or living Greyhawk. Ah, uh, I see. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, let's go to the uh, social media depository, which I will get us there by doing this. <laughs> All right, I wanted to talk about a couple of current Kickstarter, well, all current Kickstarter that's actually not current anymore. It's actually over. I hope uh, people that are interested in it can get into it. It's uh, it's called For Coin and Blood. So For Coin and Blood is an old school inspired role-playing fantasy game that um, takes the direction of playing scum and villains in the most fantasy campaign, in most fantasy campaigns. So you get to actually play assassins and cult leaders and blackguards and whatnot in a different look at the other side of the fantasy coin. So um, this is inspired by the writings of authors such as Kate Elliott, Joe Emmer, Crombie, Sarah, Monette, Glenn Cook, Anna Smith, Spark, Scott Lynch, and more. So you get to play all the anti-heroes and thieves and assassins and do all the terrible things that you want to do and realize that you're actually playing that instead of just being like, we're the good guys who walk into holes that people live in and kill them and take their stuff, which, you know, that's not evil or terrible or anything, even though those races are supposedly evil. Um... It's over, but I assume Gallant Night Games will put this out at some point on drive through uh, It was part of the Make 100 project, which um, Make 100 is uh, a Kickstarter initiative that uh, Kickstarter wants people to put up these projects where there is a backer level that has only got 100 uh, backers that can back it. That's why it's called the Make 100. Now, they can have other levels on there too, but uh, they want to have a specific thing that's just for 100 people. That is the the idea. So it's a pretty neat little project. I mean, who doesn't like playing the bad guys? And this is a thing that's actually designed for you to play the bad guys instead of everybody having to make it up on their on their own and deal with all that stuff. Um, another fun thing, Chris Shorb, he uh, found a crowdsourced herbs effects and herbs and spice name generator. So that's kind of cool. I actually pulled it up and came up with some of the names, which I wanted to throw at Nikki because Nikki likes to cook, and I'm kind of curious as to what she would build, what she would create with some of these names. <laughs> yeah, I know that you hate it when I do stuff like this to you. I do. It's okay. So, uh, Ember Basil. What would you do with Ember Basil? Um, I mean, basil can be used for pizza. I mean, it could be used for pizza, but you don't really eat, eat pizza. You do uh, make pizza caprizi. occasionally, though. Caprizi chicken. There we caprizi. go. Caprizi. So, Ember Caprizi chicken. Mm -hmm. mm, I mean, I wonder what the Ember part of the basil is. Do you think it's like already kind of like on fire and, and and hot? Maybe it can cook for you? I mean, I feel like maybe you can um, actually grill the chicken on the Ember. Oh, from yeah. The basil. And then, so it's just kind of like a smoked basil flavor. That's interesting. Yeah, that's a very interesting thing. Uh, one more uh, water caraway. I have no idea what caraway is. Do you? You're from Buffalo, dude. Yeah? Have you ever had a Kimmelweck roll? Oh, is that what the... You know those tiny little seeds? Oh, interesting. <laughs> I had no idea. Yeah. Yeah. So what would you do with water caraway? What the heck do you think water caraway is? Um, I think that it's caraway seeds that have been pounded down and put into water. So mm. it's like the essence of caraway. So what would you do with the essence of caraway? Um... I don't know. I hate it most of the time. You hate it most of the time? <laughs> I feel like you could make a pretty solid gravy or soup out of it. Oh, there you go. Um, kind of like, I know, instead of French onion soup, you can make beef on wax soup. Beef on wax soup. There we go. That would be quite delicious. I could probably make that as it is. Yeah, I mean, probably could. But, I mean, basically what you said is we just get some of that caraway. We pound it down. I uh, have some at home. Throw it in. I make chicken on wax. Oh, there you go. All right, so that's our uh, community chatter for the evening. Let's go to the Patreon shout-out. So uh, a few patrons that I'd like to thank. Uh, Wayne Peterson, Jesse Edmond, that's Doc Palindrome, uh, Donna McCarthy, Kevin Lovecraft, Scott Robinson, J.J. Lanza, and Michael Dinos. Thank you all so much for being our patrons. We greatly appreciate it. Uh, let's, uh, let's get out of here, and then we can do a, a brief after show since we've already done, I already did an after show. <laughs> um... Thank you, everybody, so much for listening. 
If you're free on Tuesday evenings at 8.45 Eastern, 6.45 the Queen's Time, come join us live on Twitch, where you can chat with other listeners in the chat room for life and ask us questions. Mm -hmm. If you cannot make it to the live show, check out our podcast each week wherever you get your podcasts, and take a listen to some of the other shows in the Misdirected Mark Network, such as Down with D&D, Advanced Insight, Pandas Talking Games, Cypher Speak with Darcy and Troy, The Gnomecast, The Wednesday Evening Podcast All-Stars, Yang Hu Hustle, and Hobbs and Friends of the OSR. You can and should also check out some of our brother and sister podcasts, She's a Super Geek, The Knights of the Night, and the always amazing Gaming MBS. Then leave us some feedback. You can reach us directly at chris at misdirectedmark.com or bob at misdirectedmark.com. Or phil at misdirectedmark.com because Bob is supposed to be here. Uh, or you can go to our Facebook group. Um, or hit them up on Twitter at, at misdirectedmark and their G Plus community. Uh-huh. The G plus community where it is not a regular at all. Like it's constantly just flowing and going and doing things. You can also catch me at the light one one. If you want to talk to Nikki, it's at it gamer girl. Uh, she won't check it cause she doesn't check Twitter ever. I think last time I was on Twitter was origins. There you go. There you go. Well, if you like what we do here and on other shows in the Mr. Active Mark Network, you can support our Patreon campaign at patreon.com backslash MMP. Patrons get access to the after show, pre-production show notes, musical parodies, the pandas, talking games, bonus outtakes, and other special releases. And with that, this has been a Mr. Active Mark production. The media arm of Encoded Designs, a mic drop. We out.